again, I started to ask, and no one could truly answer. And again, this is no disrespect to Christians. Right? These are just questions that I myself had, and I couldn't resolve. And so, as I eventually came of age, and I entered Columbia University uh, in New York City, they're returning to my place of, of birth. I actually started to explore, at your age, as a freshman at Columbia University, I started to explore uh, this, this notion of, well, what is the purpose of man, but also, you know, what is the correct religion? Which is the correct religion? And so I remember, in sitting in many, you know, Bible study sessions, I remember in contemporary civilization, of course, that looked at moral philosophy, you know, we actually studied uh, the Bible and we looked at the Quran, and I remember when I was introduced to the Qur'an, and I had been before, I didn't mention it until my uncle said convert to Islam. Um, a lot of the creed of Islam really resonated with me. And the Qur'an kind of made sense to me, because I had read not the whole thing, but passages of it. And so I, essentially all this culminated for me in one course. And that was a course that was enti entitled America and the Muslim World. And that was a course that... Uh, came out, uh, it came out post 9-11, all right, and I'll kind of talk about 9-11 a bit, um, but it came out post 9-11, and essentially that course actually addressed many of the questions I had about <coughs> Islam, all right? Now, let me jump to 9-11, and I'll come to the course. So, 9-11 happened. I'm a sophomore at Columbia University, right? And many people from my university died in 9-11. I actually witnessed 9-11 with my own eyes, and I'm a Christian at the time, all right? Um, I remember I was actually in East Campus, okay, which was, if you guys know Columbia's campus, it's the tallest building, the tallest dormitory on Columbia's campus, and it overlooks downtown. So Columbia's in uptown, right, in, in Manhattan. It was really Harlem, but they call it Manhattan. And you can see all the way downtown to the trade towers. So I remember being woken up by, oh my God, uh, and so I kind of come to him. I'm like, yo, what's going on? Why is everybody tripping? Right? What's happening? And so essentially they say, look at the news. And I look at the news, and I see that the trick, the first trade tower was hit by a plane. Right? So I'm just waking up. Imagine my disbelief. I'm just waking up. It was a good dream. I was enjoying it. And the next thing I know, here it is that the world trade towers are being attacked. And then we see a second plane come. And at that point, we realized, well, that wasn't an accident, the first one. It must have been on purpose. And we watch as we see the second plane kind of weave through the uh, skyline of New York City, and eventually it impacts. And then it goes to President Bush, right? So we're watching TV, and then it shifts to President Bush. And, and we know President Bush, I'm not going to say anything about him, but we know him. <laughs> and so he had a look that was kind of like... <laughs> And America was waiting for him to say something. He couldn't really garner up, uh, you know, the, the words to really express that which he, uh, <coughs> he believed or needed to say to address the American people. And so that event truly had an impact on me. Okay, and it led and it had an impact on many of Americans. It actually led to the creation of this course at Columbia University entitled uh, "America and the Muslim World." And so in this course, and I'm trying to wrap it up because I know Mr. Mahmoud uh, needs to go, but in this course, they actually taught, it was taught by a guy named Richard Bouillet, who was an Arabist, okay, he was a Christian professor, who actually studied in uh, Saudi Arabia, he did Arabic here, surprisingly. Um, and he actually was so good in his Arabic that he actually translated bin Laden tapes for the FBI, all right? And so you could, you know, kind of imagine, well, if he's translating bin Laden tapes, then obviously he must have a bias or a slant against Islam. It was actually quite the contrary. In this class, he spoke very highly of Islam. Right? And in this class, we learned very much about the Aqidah of Muslims, all the way from Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah to the Sufi and the Shi. And we learned very detailed stuff, maybe more than some of you might know here, okay, about, again, the Aqidah of all of them. And again, this notion of Tawheed for me just resonated. It actually took me back to those questions as a kid that I used to ask, right, to people in my church about this notion of the Trinity, right? That if we truly believe in only one God, as per the first commandment, then shouldn't we only then manifest our worship in worshiping that one God? Shouldn't I not have to deal with intercessors or righteous people? Shouldn't I be able to go directly to Allah? 
right? And so in this class, I started to actually understand that that's truly what Islam was about. And of course, as I said before, I was receiving some doubt <coughs> from my uncles, uh, brothers of my mother who had earlier converted to Islam, about five years before that time. Now, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll uh, move on to, I guess, question and answer, I think we're doing that. Uh, it's just is to essentially say, in this class, it was really interesting. Because you can imagine there were a lot of Muslims in this class. And so I remember seeing hijabis and other guys who I assume look Middle Eastern or Southeast Asian. And at a certain time in class, because this was an afternoon class, it was about 5 o'clock in the morning, they would all break open their water or their juice, take a drink and take a bite of a sandwich or something like that. And they would try to do so politely, but still you hear right, or in class a little bit. They were trying to be polite, but I was still here. And so eventually I got the goal to after class ask a young woman who was you know, easily identifiable as a Muslim because she was wearing hijab. And I asked her essentially, you know, why is it that all you Muslims at this time <laughs> are drinking and eating together? Is this like a worship thing or something? Or what's going on? You know? And she said, no, she explained to me that's Ramadan. And that Muslims during Ramadan, they actually fast. Right? And she kind of explained to me what fasting was all about. Now, I remember that left an indelible mark on me. Not just the understanding now of Tahrim, but also an understanding that you all actually sacrifice of your bodies. Right, to again try to achieve uh, you know, more piety, if you will. Right? And so that, again, for me, was very, very impactful. And so kind of looking at all of that, I, at that point, was prepared to take my shahada, but I didn't yet. Uh, it really wasn't until I walked across campus and ran to a buddy of mine to play on the baseball team. By the way, I played on the basketball team in Columbia. And so he was a baseball player. And I ran into him. I remember he was a guy from Boston. Had a really funny accent to it, you know, go back to God. And so anyway, I was talking to him. And we were just somehow we got religion. He said, Yeah, you know, I'm Muslim. I'm like, what? Get out of here. You? You're Muslim. He's like, yeah, I'm Muslim. It's like, well, why don't we become Muslim? He started telling me. I said, you know what, man? Khalas, I'm Muslim too. Because <laughs> I already believed. I already believed in the Prophet Muhammad. I already believed, you know, in the law. You know, and in this class, uh, I mentioned that, but I learned more about the Prophet Muhammad, who he was as a man, and the impact that he made on society, and his focus on justice, justice to Allah, justice to humanity, justice to all the other men. And so that impacted me too. So eventually, later on, I get back to my dorm room, I'm talking to my buddies, and how much time do I have? You have to tell them. Do I? Yeah. Just give me one more That's good. Give me two, give me two. So, with Q&A. With Q&A, okay. So essentially, um, I get back to my dorm room and I run to some of my buddies. And I'm like, you know, he gave me a book, by the way, and he gave me a prayer weapon. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this, but I'm going to figure it out, though. I'm going to figure it out. So I actually start reading through the prayer book, and I see some of the transliteration. I start saying some of the supplications and du'a and some of the prayer stuff. And some of my friends are like, well, what's going on? Man? What's the stuff that you're saying? I'm like, I just became Muslim. Now, again, I don't realize I actually have to take my shahada. Right? I think it's sufficient for me just to say I'm Muslim in class and say I'm Muslim. <laughs> and so eventually I talked to my uncle, uh, my brother's youngest uh, brother, who converted to Islam before. And I get the phone, I'm like, yo, I'm Muslim. <laughs> He's like, mashallah, when did you take your shahada? And I'm like, yo, what did you say about my mama? <laughs> 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 I have no idea what the shahada was. I had absolutely no idea. I didn't know. And he explained to me, no, you actually have to do your declaration of faith. And so I remember it. It was on ESPN. We played Rutgers University in the preseason of IT. And unfortunately, we lost to Rutgers. A very sad day of my life. Right? It was on ESPN televised, and we got our butts kicked in front of all my friends <laughs> back at home. But it was also the best day of my life. And so far as the day that after the game, my uncle actually gave me my shahada, and I entered into El Islam. And so the last thing I would say, and then we'll have Q&A, is just to say that Islam for me has been transformational. I now feel as though I understand my purpose. And that's not just manifested in me actually going to the masjid, as some believe, but it's manifested in my engagement with you. When I smile you know, at you all in the hall, when I teach you, I do the best that I can do. When I'm good to my mother, you know, when I'm kicking up trash, right? when I'm good to the non-Muslims, and I give them the respect that's due to them. Because Islam is not something that is you know, very narrow, it's something that's vast. And our impact as Muslims should be the same way. Our prophet, peace be upon him, didn't just worry about trying to help the Muslims. He was focused on trying to empower humanity. 
focusing on the tahid. And so I think that I would encourage all of us to truly follow that. Not just to pray the masjid or don the hijab or the baya or the beard or the pants of sack, but actually to inculcate the Islam within us in a way that allows us to transform humanity, to make the world a better place. On that note, I got to close. I'm done. It's now your time. slave of the martyr, but being the slave of the witness, because a lot of Arabs have questions about that. Um, Allah huwa ashihi. Um, but no, for me, I actually, I like my original name. You know, I don't have it. My, my dad gave it to me. And I also know that you know, some people can, back at home can be put off by that. You know, uh, for those people who decide to do that, that's great for them. You know, may Allah preserve them, you know, doing that. I myself want to hold on to my original name. And in terms of Islamic jurisprudence, you know, fit, I'm not obligated to change my life. I don't have to change my life. I have a keep job. Okay, once I think we have to jump around again, but please do it. Uh, yeah, let's get one of the ladies, and then we'll come back down from there. So, ladies and gentlemen? No? Question? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Especially my parents. Especially my parents. Yeah, I was really lucky um, that I actually did it. I would say that for a lot of African Americans, because we don't know who our ancestors were, to be honest with you, where they came in Africa. I mean, that's 500 years ago. And slavery truly erased all that. But there are some practices that are still in black churches, right, that, that are still close to Islam. Like, for instance, my grandmother would never step, set foot in the church without having her hair cut. <coughs> She wouldn't do it. A lot of the churches in the South actually face east. So there's a lot of Islam that's kind of survived. So my point is that I didn't really face those type of issues, right? Um, I know some black Americans have, but my family was pretty open. And again, I had Muslims in my family. I had people who converted to Islam, so they made it easy for me. I didn't have a problem. <coughs> yeah. All right. Got the um, Salaam alaikum. Speak loud, yeah. OK. Um, most of us, uh, we were born Muslims, yeah. so we take Islam for granted. Yeah. So, in your opinion, is there uh, like a, a different way of seeing Islam, uh, like between the, those who were born Muslim and those who weren't? Yeah. So, this question essentially is, you know, because of the fact that I actually decided to become Muslim, and a lot of you guys here were born into Islam. Um, you know. Is there a way, again, I'm trying to extrapolate from what you're saying, but is there a way to... Um, like, do you appreciate Islam more than, than do I those who... appreciate Islam more than you? Well, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't know that. I mean, that's really in general. I mean, in general, I don't know if I appreciate it more. I mean, I know that I did have the decision to actually embrace Islam. And I would say for all of you, I would do the same too. I would start from square one to really look at your faith and to question it, just as I did mine. And for me, it led me to Islam. I don't see why you guys would do that in any other different way. I mean, the tahid is clear. But I think that if you're not actually going and experiencing it yourself, if you're just relying on your parents or your society to do it for you, that's going to impact your relationship with God. And so one thing that I would say in answer to that question is I do see in the Muslim world that there is a focus on orthodoxy, right? As opposed to orthodoxy, what I mean to say is that Islam actually combines practice with belief. That's the great thing about Islam. But oftentimes we see in the Muslim world that people, and this is also in America too with Christendom and stuff, that people become so focused on the practice that they forget about the spirituality. And I also think here in reacting to the Sufis and stuff like that here, that we might, some people here have forgotten about the actual belief. Right? That, that you know, yes, we know the Sufis are only, you know, a lot of them are focused about just becoming close to Allah. Um, but that's actually a good thing. Right? We don't believe that we can become one with Allah, 
But as Ahmed Sunnah, we should be thinking about how we can improve our relationship with God. Right? And so, again, I encourage you all to find that spirituality. Don't just go and pray because people tell you to or because you have to do it five times a day. Or to wear a hijab just because you should or to grow a beard and have your pants, whatever. I mean, really, I would try to work on creating my relationship with God. And once you do that, all those other things will follow suit. Is that it? My time is your party needs to go. All right. Let's start with me. Klaus, thank you very much. MashaAllah, his story is very deep in thought, very reflective. My story is more of a, what I would like to call, Uh, controlled randomness. Oh. Anyone who's known me for any time before I came here, and then there's some people who met me once I came to this country, that there are three things that are extremely known for my family. Number one is education. My father was the first guy in his family to go to university. He did so with a cardboard box, the pair of pants he had on, maybe a few pieces of change in his pocket. And the disdainment from his father for leaving the farm, and the fear that his mother would kill him if he didn't go. <laughs> My mother was drugged to university by her older sister. So they were the two first people of their siblings in the family to go to university. And so in my house, from day one, education was of the utmost importance. So because education was important, I went to this university in North Carolina, where I'm from. Small place in North Carolina, less than 10,000 people in my city. So education, a random thing that happened to me because I was born to two people who value a university education. Gray hair. Anyone that knows anything about the Harding family, we get gray hair. You can't see my gray hair because I cut it really short because I don't want you to see it. <laughs> but this is my aunt. She was an assistant professor at the university that was in the first slot. She worked there for 42 years. She just retired this semester. So when I arrived on that campus, maybe it wasn't even a week. You have to go get your textbook. So I'm waiting in line to get my textbook. I don't see my aunt walk in the building. But the guy behind me is like, yo, who's the lady with the big gray hair? <laughs> <laughs> That's my aunt. <laughs> my aunt sees me. She says, look, you don't have to wait in this line. I'll, I'll take you to get your book. So the guy behind me is like, can I come with you? I'm like, sure, come with me. So we go get our book. A couple of days may pass, a day or two. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. But the next thing, if anybody knows anything about my family, we love basketball. My mother watches basketball. My father. My sister has hopes that one of my children will be an NBA basketball player. <laughs> so basketball, we eat, sleep, basketball. So I'm walking on the campus, this guy behind me who spotted my aunt, which caused me to get her attention, which caused us to meet. I'm walking, he's walking, and another guy's walking with him. They pass me, he says, I remember you from the line. We're going to go shoot basketball. You want to come play? Sure. Play basketball. Go play basketball. We haven't played 10 minutes. Three plays. I shoot. I come down. I severely sprain my ankle. The guy who's behind me, his name is Bishop. He tells his friend, Sadiq, let's help this guy to the infirmary. So these guys, they help me go all the way across campus. So I meet this guy named Sadiq. I know this guy for maybe four or five years. 
Sadiq, what kind of name is Sadiq Abdullah? I've never heard anything like that before. What is that? Where are you from? He says, I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> New Jersey? I don't know anything about this. My hometown has 10,000 people. Everybody's Christian. I don't know anything else. Nothing. I don't even remember hearing the word Islam in my life. Allah, Muhammad, Quran. I never heard it. If I did hear it, it didn't resonate with me. I have no idea. This is a complete random event. A God from a place with 10,000 people is in line behind, in front of a guy who happens to know a Muslim guy that he grew up with in New Jersey. So we become friends. We hang out and play basketball years past. Many things happen in between this. To make the story short, one night at my house, I'm thinking, because I know this guy, Bastard. I know about how to see him and I've heard the Adhan. And I get scared. I get really scared. So I call this guy, Sadiq. I want to become a Muslim. He says, OK. I said, I'm going to do it in the morning. He says, OK. Come over there in the morning. I'm going to give you a shout. Hang up the phone. I feel really, feel really good. I made a decision. Phone rings again. Well, there's no texting. I know all of you are. Texting is not. In the 80s, we didn't have this. No internet. This tech, no YouTube in the 80s. So he calls me. He says, Yo, I call my mother. She said, What are you doing? What if he dies tonight in his sleep? Calls me, says she said you might die, so I should go now. <laughs> so I'm sitting in my room with the dog, please let me die. So this guy comes over late at night, he gives me my shahada, and that's how I became Muslim. It wasn't any compliment. Maybe I had these same questions. Maybe I didn't. I don't really remember. I remember going to university, reading different books, looking at um, different pamphlets, being around Muslims, seeing people pray. But it wasn't a really a, a situation where I contemplated in deep thought over the course of my life. It was a completely random set of events that led me to meet somebody that by his hand I accepted his life. So the thing that resonates with me when it comes to Islam and the question I ask, do I feel different than someone who's born Muslim? My son asked me this question. He says, you know, you went through something that not a lot of people will go through. I don't know what it would be like to accept Islam. <laughs> I told him, no, no, you, you, you will have to accept this now. Because if you're born from Muslim parents, doesn't mean that you're going to believe. Doesn't mean you're going to adhere. Doesn't mean you're going to pray or fast. Doesn't mean you'll make Umrah or Hajj. As an adult, you'll make that decision. Am I going to adhere to what Islam asks me to do and try to be an example of a Muslim? Or am I not going to do that? Because just because someone is Muslim, it doesn't mean that they're honest. It doesn't mean that they're charitable. Those are still decisions. So I made a decision later in life, and I'm sure that each and every one of you at some point in your life have made a decision or will make a decision. So this is how I came to Islam, a decision that was a culmination of a lot of random events. That I had no idea that these things were being put into motion. But I remember that night when I took my shahada. The one feeling that I had was relief. 
I really felt relieved. You know how you feel relieved when you look on your transcript and see an A in calculus? <laughs> I don't feel it. Or for some of you, when you see you pass. <laughs> it was that kind of relief. And the person who gave me my shahada is someone that's a dear friend of mine. I've known him since I was 18 years old. And Allah put into place a series of events that our paths crossed. And when our paths crossed, those events led me to accept this country. And that's how I began. Yeah, just uh, a couple of questions. Uh, girls, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Growing up, I went through many phases. So my parents thought it was just another phase that I was going through. So they're thinking, yeah, he'll do this for a while, then he'll do something else. Uh, if you know anything about the South, eating pork is a staple of the diet. So I go home to visit. My mother cooks all this food, and I can't eat any of it. She's like, hey, okay, okay. Maybe one day he'll come back and change. So then I get married, and I marry a Muslim woman. Okay, mm, this is a little more serious. One day, maybe he'll change. <laughs> then I have a child. And some of the things that they want to do with my child, I don't want them to do it. Okay, this is a little more serious than we thought. And then I remember the day that I told them I was moving to Saudi Arabia to teach math. That hurt. Because my mother and my father cried. And they didn't cry because I'm leaving the planet Earth and I'll never see them again. But I know why my father cried on the floor against the wall and cried. I know why he did it. Because at that moment, he probably realized that I had accepted Islam for the rest of my life and I wasn't going to change. So, I didn't have overt uh, pushback from my parents when I became Muslim. But I know, I know it hurt. And I know that there's one thing that would make them happy for me to leave Islam and come back to that Christian church and sing those songs like I did when I was a kid. I know it would. I can hear it in their voice sometimes when I talk to them. So that's one of the things that keeps me focused in trying to achieve all of the good deeds that I can. Because even though they're my parents and they love me with all their heart, there's this part of me that's different, and they know it. Even my mother one day said, when we were sitting outside, she told me that someone that we knew had passed away had died. And she was like, when I die, I hope I get to see you. And I know that that might not happen if she doesn't accept this life. So coming to Islam, not being a Muslim, there's things that happen. The people will be joyful in front of your face. They'll be happy. But in their heart, they want you back. Deep in their heart, they want you back. I had one uncle who passed away three years ago. He was the only one in my family that ever called me Mahmoud. And he told me how my father felt. Not a day goes by that he doesn't pray that I come back to Christian. So that's difficult. I live with that. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. One more right here. Yes. Yeah. I have it five one five. When I talk to my father, my father is a very scholarly kind of man. My father teaches Bible classes. He reads different books written by biblical scholars. <coughs> and then I have serious conversations. And we talk very deeply about the Christianity. 
and they get very difficult at times. Because my father said to me one day, he says, either you're going to believe what I believe or you're not going to believe what I believe. And that's what it comes down to, belief. And we may debate this point in the Quran, this point in the Bible, <coughs> Isa alayhi salam said this, but he did that. But it comes down to belief. And even amongst my friends when we were at this university, we all sat and heard the same things. We read some of the same books. We had some of the same beliefs. And not every one of us became Muslim. Some of us accepted Islam and stayed with it. Some of us never accepted it. Some of us accepted it and left it. It's really what the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah controls who he wants to be Muslim and Allah controls who he doesn't want to be Muslim. And if the Prophet ﷺ, if he had relatives, the Prophet, the, right here, people can touch him. They hear his word. And these people loved him and they tried to protect him, like his uncle. And he still wouldn't accept this now. That's similar to my situation. Not that I'm a prophet by any means. <laughs> but I have people that I love and I've talked to them. And they're educated people and they can read. And they're logical people, but they don't believe. One more in this. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what were the, the things in the, in the past that uh, they were bad and uh, now they are good? I mean, after you are converted to Islam. The honor and the respect that I give to my parents. I always was the kind of guy, in the South, it's very traditional to obey your parents. That's what you do. But I try to take it even a step further, like the I am Surah Isra. Kama Rabbayani Sahira. I would wash my mother's feet if she asked me. There's nothing I wouldn't do for my mother or father. And so this is the thing that, from Islam, that has increased. I, whatever my parents, as long as it's not against my religion, whatever my parents ask me to do, I do it. And I do it right then. I don't wait. I run to the Christian In the hopes that my respect and honor for them somehow jar their heart and make them accept this. Uh, everyone, there's still 15 minutes left. If you guys have more questions for Mr. Maurice, go ahead. Just, just not thank you all for coming. Thank you.